this time on Earth Focus. Link TV's coverage of the 2008 Environmental Film Festival held in Washington, D.C., with excerpts from feature films and interviews with festival participants, water advocate David Douglas, and filmmaker Irina Salina on the global water challenges we face today. All coming up on Earth Focus. The 2008 Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital screened 115 films from 30 countries on a wide range of environmental issues. More than 24,000 people attended the festival over 11 days, the largest number in the 16-year history of the event. Earth Focus compiled clips from some of the featured films. Here's a look. That bird has been in my deep, deep psyche since I knew about it back when I was a kid. You know, here is mystery, especially to us kids and birders. What, what a wonder it would be eventually to see one of those. Could I ever see one? I first learned about the Ivoryville Woodpecker back in 1972. I was 17 years old. I had read an article in Life magazine written by Don Mosier about John Dennis, who never gave up hope that the Ivory Bill was still alive. After reading that article, I believe that there were still Ivory Bill Woodpeckers out there. I wanted to go see Ivory Bills. I wanted to be the person to find one. I wanted to be the person to, to photograph one. We know that in the future, we are rendering this planet damn near uninhabitable. So as we move closer toward that, we're trying to devise a method of living that allows people to take care of themselves. The Phoenix. There is nothing coming into this house. No power lines, no gas lines, no sewage lines going out, no water lines coming in, no energy being used. So we're sitting on 6,000 gallons of water, food growing, sewage internalized, 70 degree space year round. What these kind of houses are doing is taking every aspect of your life and putting it into your own hands. A family of four could totally survive here without even going to the store. This year, the Environmental Film Festival coincided with World Water Day, celebrated on March 22nd to highlight the importance of global water issues. A number of films, discussions, and special events at the festival focused on the challenges involved in providing safe and adequate drinking water for all. Water in Malawi is just very great. Uh, up to now, women are traveling over five kilometers to get a dirty bucket of water. And uh, usually, the end result is waterborne diseases. I will tell you a very interesting story. 
in our impact area, which is Planta Ruru. 40% of the school-going girls were dropping out of school because of lack of sanitation. But in the areas where we have provided some latrines, it's interesting that the dropout number has improved from 40% to 6%. Water experts, policymakers, activists, and educators were among those who participated in the festival's water-related events. Well, there are many problems with water, but probably the most significant problem is the fact that there are more than a billion people today in the 21st century who don't have access to safe drinking water, or uh, even worse, two and a half billion that don't have access to adequate sanitation services, something all of us take completely for granted. And that, in my opinion, is a true water crisis. It is an investment that's worth making. I, I used to be an investment banker. People ask me for good investment advice. I will tell you, you invest in water and sanitation in schools, the return on that investment is many times over what it's going to cost you to invest. David Douglas, a director of Water Advocates, a clean water action group, participated in an expert's panel on water challenges. Douglas, an environmental lawyer, is also founder of the Santa Fe, New Mexico-based nonprofit organization Water Lines, which has provided technical help and funding for drinking water projects in over 200 rural communities in 12 countries. Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson spoke with David Douglas about global water problems and ways to solve them. David Douglas, tell us about water advocates and about water lines. Uh, well, it, it begins for me, Miles, about uh, mid-1980s. I was writing uh, on environmental, religious issues, and uh, we were living in Santa Fe, in New Mexico, where we still still live. And I was uh, had a, a, a daughter that was sick one night. She was a brand new infant, and she was. I was walking her in the middle of the. Uh, in the middle of the night and we had our house had been without water we lived in the mountains above santa fe and we had been without water in our community for a period of time and i found myself wondering at about 4 a.m uh, what would it be like to live in a part of the world where you had no clean drinking water to rehydrate your sick child in the in the morning i began to do some research and found two things back in the mid-1980s one that the casually told around the world um, from diseases associated with, uh, with inadequate drinking water and sanitation um, were represented the leading public health problem around the, around the globe. Secondly, that very little had been written about it in the, in the mainstream media. As Americans, we had tended to forget the importance of the basics, clean drinking water, adequate sanitation. We understood it in our own country, for, but we did not have the global view and I began to write uh, for environmental magazines, you know, religious magazines, developmental magazines, but the point was that the issue was critical, um, that there was something that Americans uh, could do about it. I kept saying, in addition to writing about it, why don't we start to help get clean drinking water to people on the ground and that was the birth of this organization called Water Lines, which implements clean drinking water projects around the world. What year did that begin? We incorporated as a nonprofit in New Mexico in 1988. We started in Mexico and have since expanded in the last 20, a little over 20 years, uh, to uh, 12 countries. And several years ago, together with some of the, uh, the water, the chief water people for some of the major uh, nonprofit organizations in this country, we had a meeting and said, isn't it time to start an advocacy organization in Washington, D.C.? Uh, to lobby Congress on behalf of clean drinking water to increase funding abroad and to also work with four other constituencies here in America, uh, foundations, uh, faith communities, corporations, and civic organizations. And uh, the organization there is called Water Advocates. Tell me for a moment about Water Advocates. How tough a job is it lobbying Congress to do something about fresh water and sanitation outside the United States. We've seen the, this issue um, pull together people that have come together on very few other issues. Um, they recognize that from the standpoint of global health, how it affects economics, 
uh, how it affects gender rights and women, how it affects kids in school, how it affects transboundary issue and the potential for conflict and national security. Water, clean drinking water and adequate sanitation is at the base of, all, of so many of those. And so we've seen from the very first days when Senator Frist, as a medical doctor, knew firsthand the importance of clean drinking water, uh, or urged in the Senate and uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, progressive Democrat from Portland, Oregon, urged in the House, came coming together, bringing many of their colleagues that span the political spectrum, and they came together uh, with the passage of what was called, became called, the, uh, the, the Water for the Poor Act of 2005. Is that the entirety of the U.S. government's effort to uh, improve water, uh, safe drinking water conditions uh, overseas. The General Accounting Office did a did a study uh, several years back, and they estimated about 50 billion dollars a year. That includes this country and overseas. Uh, only about five percent was overseas. So 95 percent of funding by the U.S. government uh, is really is really domestic. Uh, but you have you have five percent that's international. And in addition to that funding for the, for the drinking water for the poor, there's also uh, uh, has been in the past significant funding uh, through USAID, for example, for uh, water in Iraq and Afghanistan. Tell me a little bit about the water lines programs. What would a typical project uh, look like and how many people would be affected by it? Right. A typical problem would be a community would come to us from a rural um, a rural section of, of western Panama and it would likely be an indigenous community of 300 to 500 people. Um, they would have been knocking on the door of their municipal government for a number of years unsuccessfully um, with a proposal to tap a spring in the hills above their community at the distance of three to five miles and to buy pipeline PVC pipeline that would, that would run by gravity uh, from a protected spring sufficient water down into the community. And the cost uh, would be between $5,000 to $8,000 for the protecting the spring, the cost of the tubing, uh, a holding tank in the center of the town, and then the community itself might add some additional funds to distribute uh, lines out to individual houses. But that would be, uh, we, would, we would receive that proposal and give it to uh, a number of experts who are very skilled in uh, judging if there's enough elevation loss to indeed bring the water down by gravity, um, the risk of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the problems with airlock, the, uh, uh, the difficulty of how the community would uh, com you know, monitor uh, the program over times and, and, and time and repair. Uh, breaks uh, to the line and, and uh, difficulty with the tanks. And then if all that worked, water lines, we would go out. We would tend to ask someone, would you be able to help with this on a one-to-one -one basis? And uh, the, we would get then a grant and we would funnel that through to, the, to a, wa a water committee or a nonprofit organization working in that community. Uh, and then the community itself would raise 25% of the cost. We ask every community we work with to raise 25% of the funds. And where you succeed, what kind of transformation takes place in that community? In a recent letter that we got from a, a principal of a, of a high school in Kenya was he said, ever since uh, we worked to get a rainwater catchment tank, we've seen um, an increase in enrollment, uh, particularly among girls, we have increased test grades nationally, discipline has improved, and we've seen a 90% reduction of disease. You're engaged in dealing with the people who are now facing those problems right now. Uh, is there any danger that uh, the efforts that, that are required to do that, to, to, to solve the problem for the person who's feeling it right now, are going to be overshadowed by the, uh, by the concern about what's coming down the road? What we're trying to do at the same time is to make the point that climate change will exacerbate problems, that things are going to get worse unless we get ahead of the, the curve here. But the problem today is that the house is on fire with those 4,500 children that will be dying today. 
The, st the, the, the difficulty is here now. There is something that we can do now and that we need to keep our eye on both the short term and the long term. David Douglas, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Miles. I appreciate it. At the Environmental Film Festival, Water Advocates joined other non-governmental groups, foundations, and corporations to launch its WASH in Schools initiative. WASH is an acronym for Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene. Water Advocates announced plans to bring WASH programs to a thousand schools in developing countries as part of an initiative first introduced by UNICEF in 2003. The launch of the WASH in Schools initiative showcased H2O for Life, a non-governmental organization that grew out of the success and enthusiasm of a group of eighth graders in New Brighton, Minnesota, and their effort to bring clean water to a school in Kenya. Here is their story. H2O for Life, School to School, provides partnerships for schools in the United States of America with schools in developing countries to build water, sanitation, and hygiene education projects as part of the WASH initiative. In doing so, H2O for Life is preventing the long journey these children have to make every day. To watch people walk great distances and to see people filling that up and drinking that or bringing that back to their family or their little babies. To know that even if your child is sick, you could not give them a clean drink of water um, is something that I could never imagine. They would just go down and they'd scoop it out of the same place where the, the cows were drinking from. I don't think I could, I don't think I could do that. I've had the opportunity to travel in Africa on several different occasions and to see what people need and to see how much they appreciate what we can do in the United States, I feel we really need to help make a difference in their lives. H2O for Life began as a single project at Highview Middle School located in Minnesota. We see wonderful things happening not only in developing nations, but in our United States schools. We saw t-shirts, we saw lanyards, we saw water. <laughs> My favorite activity was the family fun night. My favorite activity in all of this has been our walk for water. We walked around the track to see what it was like to walk such a far length and we tried to raise money for every lap that we did. In one of the schools at Kathungu School, we're actually working on rain catchment systems. Another project in that area is a borehole and a pump. And then we also have one project which is um, a pipeline coming off of a pipe coming from Kilimanjaro. The students we were helping were in a school in the Kwakasolo Water District. So we wrote to them and we saw pictures of them with the water and, we, and they, looked so, they looked so happy. And we just felt really good because we were, we were the ones that were helping them feel really, making them feel that happy. H2O for Life connects individual schools in the United States with schools in developing countries to build a WASH project. Some 14 U.S. schools are already involved in the program. <laughs> The United States does not keep active records of how many people get sick from our water supply every year. There are estimates that from 500,000 to 7 million people get sick per year from drinking their tap water. One of the problems is that we have uh, lots of bugs in the system, viruses, pathogens, bacteria. A lot of those things that you think of as stomach viruses or flus, about 40% of those come from your drinking water. We are not removing things like industrial chemicals, rocket fuel, pesticides, certain pharmaceuticals, drugs that were discharged either by big animal factories or by sewage treatment plants. A lot of people think they don't have to worry about their water supply because they go out and buy bottled water. Well, we have news for them. In fact, a lot of your exposure to many of the chemicals comes from the simple act of showering in them. So some of these more volatile pollutants come in through your skin. Flow for Love of Water is a 2008 Sundance Film Festival selection and had its Washington, D.C. premiere at the Environmental Film Festival. Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson spoke with the film's director, Irina Selina, about what drove her to make the film. Irina Salina, 
You've directed one of the blockbuster presentations here at the Environmental Film Festival, Flow for Love of Water. Tell us about that. The film is a sort of wake-up call to, to people about the world water crisis. When I say I don't like the word world water crisis, but what is going on exactly with water when you think of global warming, for example, that has a big impact on water, you know, the, the, the weather is changing, what is happening to our rivers? We think our rivers are just running, but a lot of them are not reaching the sea anymore. Aquifera are running dry, pollution of water is very big, then so once you have uh, something becoming a commodity, what happens? A lot of privatization comes in. Privatization of water is one of the subjects. And then you realize that it's, it's no longer just like, oh, us American it's, and versus Africa or India. It, we're, we're very much all in the same boat right now. We take water for granted in this country. Are you saying that we're not going to be able to do that forever? Uh, yes. You have it right. And it's not that we're on our way. We are in, not in a good place with water. And one of the big problem is, apart from global warming, is that we have polluted and depleted a lot of our groundwater aquifer, our groundwater in general. And we are not allowing to, for, the, to, for all the groundwater and aquifer to recharge properly. So, there's a very natural cycle. You have the rain falling and the rain will recharge. But now what's happened is that the rain keeps, takes first of all all the pollution and keeps going in one direction and goes back to the sea without having its chance to recharge. So that's one of the problems. The pollution, we're going to have to change our, a little bit our way of, of going about life. Seventy percent of the water consumption in the world, I'm told, is for agricultural production. And that if we're running out of water, or, or the water isn't going to be accessible anymore, that means no more corn, no more wheat, no more food. This is a really big problem, isn't it? The problem now is you get all those big rains that gives big floods at the moment where we don't expect it, and when you expect the rain, you're not getting it. And also, it's not just the plants, but everything is getting the wrong signal. You know, the plants that are, or the flowers, that are supposed to come at one point because it's hotter earlier, like ch it changes the cycle. So, so every my concept is that everything is connected. If like, everything like, is connected, then the problems are going to cascade down on us all together and build momentum. And do we have the technological savvy? Do we have the the financial resources to really reverse this process? Yeah, no, we need the will. It's going to be a combination of, of modern technology, but sometimes it's also coming back to old knowledge. Roof water harvesting. You could recycle rainwater in a very easy way. We're going to have to change our way. And, and in, in, when I was saying everything is connected, it's also, if I have a big field, all right, and you're an organic, uh, no, a small organic farmer a kilometers away, and I'm putting a lot, I'm, I'm putting a lot of herbicide and pesticide in, in my field. Whether I like it or not, this is going to go in the groundwater, this is going to go in the rivers, and this is ultimately coming back to us. But it's also evaporating, going in the clouds and going down on your field, whether you like it or not. They have found traces of certain chemicals, certain herbicide in national forests, where no one is allowed to even, you know, leave a piece of paper. But we can't control the cycle. So it comes back to us at the end of the day. What do you say to people who argue uh, just the opposite, that, that e an economic remedy is what's needed and that uh, if you privatize water uh, distribution, that'll solve the problem because it'll become profitable to, be, to, to make sure that people have water and uh, that that might therefore be the solution, not the problem. I know it's, it's always a, a strong argument. Plus people, there's something reassuring. If a private company comes and, and they take care of our water, we're going to be all safe. Unfortunately, if you look at track records of those companies, they have to bring money back to the stakeholder. You know, so there is, there is no remedy. So they will spend a little money in the infrastructure, and, but there they, they will be less transparency. Somehow you've seen in a lot of places the price goes up. And it's not in the advantage to get the most expensive technology cleaning your water because then they're going to lose money. In my film, there's a man who worked for 15 years with Vivendi. He was doing the accounting. 
And then one day he was in a board meeting and he's, he's looking at the numbers he's like, wait a minute, this was the money from the consumer paying every month, supposed to go in the repair of the pipes, but that money was going to private banking account in Ireland. Do I really want to trust those people? And so whether it's private or non-private, it's just, it's not all privatization is going to give us a solution. I think we need to go back to strong regulation and some bigger moral. I think we have trespass the the moral of and it's not America versus France it's everywhere there's less much less moral and I think we where do we make money but where do we take care of our people you know there's a sure you someone wants to make profit but under under what circumstances and not on the circumstances of people's health Water is a very complex issue. It's a huge yeah. issue, and your film tries to deal with as many aspects of it as you can deal with mm -hmm. in a, a, a 93 minutes, is that? In an 84 right? minutes, 84 yes. minute film. How long did it take you to make it? Five years. And how long, is your, ha, how long have you been uh, passionately involved with the issue of water? I really, to tell you the truth, when I really it struck me what I was paying more attention to my food and the water and it's all connected is when I became a mother. It just instinctly, like, what is she going to eat? No, like, you know, you know, I didn't care, you know, I would just eat a pizza, whatever. But when it came to my baby, my first baby, it's like she has to have, like, what is starting to look? Where is this grown? You know, is there, you know, being more aware, paying more attention to articles I might have flipped? And then I saw, I saw and heard on the radio Bobby Kennedy Jr. with the entertainment, no, the entertainment, sorry, the lawyer, environment, big environmental lawyer with River Keepers up the Hudson. And I was just fascinated. I, I heard about like those boats coming from the Caribbean, dumping horrible stuff in the Hudson River, leaving, getting away with, and just, I started reading more about that. I, he talked about acid rain, he talked about checking his family for lead and other things because he was already talking somehow that it was coming back in our system and they all had all sort of chemicals. So imagine I just had a baby, I was like, oh my God. And then I read an article in The Nation called Who Owns Water? Is water gonna be the oil of the 21st century? And I think that really got me going. Irena Salita, thank you very much. You're more than welcome. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs that connect you to the world.